Coming up on Aging Matters, Nutrition and Aging. I think, am I eating a balanced diet? Am I putting enough food in my body, the right combinations to keep my health and my energy up? When you talk about aging matters, you know, nutrition certainly matters as far as uh, having a healthy lifestyle and, and being able to continue to pursue one's activities in later life. Baby boomers are aging with more nutrition-related health problems than previous generations, according to America's health rankings. A 55% higher prevalence of diabetes, a 25% higher prevalence of obesity, a 9% lower prevalence of very good or excellent health status. Stress, individuals work more hours, longer hours. We travel by car, we don't walk as much, we don't have a lot of energy expenditure, and what we eat also matters. There's areas in the United States when it's very hard to find a store with healthy foods. I think people don't realize that we have the need in this country that we have. I mean, your neighbor could be starving and you may not know it. They may have food in their cabinets, but they may not be able to prepare it. Or they may have money, but they may not be able to, to get to the grocery store or walk around the grocery store or get, have transportation. Well, that's what people want. They want food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But a liter of Coke, a liter of Pepsi, stuff like that, goes real quick. One out of every four older adults in our nation have some form of malnutrition. I have to tell you that you can be overweight and malnourished at the same time. The takeaway here is really that food is medicine and the provision of food should be central to provision of health care. It should be a routine part of health care. Food is just the most basic of needs. Everybody has a right to not be hungry. So it's really scary to be facing this wave of the boom in population at this age and us scrambling to fill that need. Major funding for NPT Reports, Aging Matters, is provided by the West End Home Foundation, improving the quality of life of seniors through the support of nonprofit organizations in Middle Tennessee, the HCA Foundation on behalf of TriStar Health, the Jeanette Travis Foundation, dedicated to improving the health and well-being of the Middle Tennessee community, and Cigna HealthSpring. Additional support provided by Lyle Parham Wealth Management of UBS Financial Services Incorporated, Jackson National Life Insurance Company, the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, and by members of NPT. Thank you. Of all diseases that can affect how we age, you probably don't think of malnutrition. But researchers say more and more older adults are malnourished, even though they look healthy or can even be overweight. It's not always because of poor eating habits. As we age, our bodies simply do not process foods and nutrients the same way. Some functions, like swallowing and digestion, change as we grow older, and medications can affect how nutrients are absorbed by the body. In addition, many older adults face practical challenges to good nutrition. They can't get around easily or can't afford healthy foods. Malnutrition or undernutrition is now considered a hidden epidemic among older adults in the United States. How do you know if you're malnourished if you can't tell by looking? Can we change our diet to improve our health as we age? What resources are available to help older people get access to quality foods and nutrients? I'm Kathy Matea. Join me for this edition of Aging Matters as we learn how to identify who's at risk of malnutrition and strategies for using food and nutrients to help with healthy aging. I believe in nutrition. I try to eat balanced diets. I have had some nutritional issues in the past, so maybe I'm just more attuned to it than some people are. As she nears age 70, Patty Hennegar is focusing more than ever on what she eats and drinks as key to healthy aging. 
I would say it should be your top priority. You know, the, the old expression is, why would you do anything to a new car but put the best fuel in it? The body is aging, and we need to offset that if at all possible through nutrition. Should it be ranked as high as exercise? That's almost comparing apples and oranges. But it is very important because without the fuel, your body is not going to stay healthy. It, you're not going to be able to function up to your maximum. It sounds so simple, basic, that nutrition can affect how well our bodies function as we age. But the concept is more complex than many people realized before the current wave of baby boomers began to age and cause a spike in nutrition-related diseases and disabilities. The connection is redefining how health professionals think of malnutrition. 25% of community-dwelling older adults have malnutrition. That means one out of every four older adults in our nation, at minimum, have some form of malnutrition. And so this is not just a problem that occurs in hospitals or in nursing home facilities or in assisted living. This is our older adults in our nation in general that have a condition that puts them at greater risk. Dr. Heidi Silver is a Vanderbilt University professor and nutritionist who studies malnutrition and aging health. Most often when we think about malnutrition, we're thinking about it occurring more often in less developed, less resource-rich countries where we see starvation, extreme weight loss, extreme hunger, and chronic inadequate food intake. But that's only one form of malnutrition. And the malnutrition we see here in the United States takes a different form. And it's less obvious in its physical signs, and it's easily masked by other conditions like illness or injury or inflammation or even higher body weight have to tell you that you can be overweight and malnourished at the same time. In the aging population, it's, it requires even additional effort to understand if that excess weight is a problem or not. Dr. Nadia Petrakoska sees people who are malnourished every day in her New Jersey clinic as a specialist in obesity medicine. There is many, many reasons and there's a lot of things we know and a lot of things we don't know. Genes, our genes are changing. Um, the environment is changing our genes. The way we eat, society has been affecting what we're doing. Stress, individuals work more hours, longer hours. We travel by car, we don't walk as much, we don't have a lot of energy expenditure. What we eat also matters. A lot of foods are processed. There's areas in the United States when it's very hard to find a store with healthy foods. Food deserts are parts of the country without access to fresh fruits, vegetables, and other healthy foods, mainly due to a lack of grocery stores and farmers markets. The USDA has mapped the nation's food deserts. This one of Nashville-Davidson County shows low-income urban areas that are more than a mile away from grocery stores rural areas that are 10 miles away, and areas where residents don't have access to cars. At the same time, these areas often have quickie marts that sell mostly processed sugar and fat-laden foods, contributing to obesity and malnutrition. Malnutrition isn't marked by uh, low weight. It's not marked by, uh, you know, these normal things that we would associate with malnutrition. Malnutrition is not getting proper dietary requirements met by the foods that you're eating. I think that the doctors and healthcare professionals are going to start to encounter a lot more people who are malnourished that don't necessarily fit the normal definition of malnutrition or the normal look of what malnutrition would look like. If you can have a seat right up here. Healthcare professionals often overlook or ignore key signs of malnutrition, in part due to lack of training, according to Dr. Silver. I think there's just less emphasis on nutrition as a component of medical school and nursing school curriculums 
than other factors that are part of the curriculum like pharmacology or cardiology or endocrinology. And there has been a consensus statement recently from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition who have identified six prominent clinical characteristics of malnutrition in today's patient. Those six characteristics are weight loss, energy intake, fat loss, muscle loss, fluid accumulation, hand grip strength. So is that malnutrition or is that just aging? And it's a fine line, isn't it? It's a fine line between what's normal aging and when it becomes malnutrition. And it's really how severe. So one of the things we start with is your hair. Is it coming out easily? Is there a larger amount of hair falling out? Is it becoming very brittle and breaking off? At the sides of the head, the temporalis muscle, we look at is it becoming indented? Is there a depression there? Which tells us that you might be losing muscle mass as you get older. So muscle is built by eating protein, correct? Eating protein and exercising, particularly resistance type exercises. As in weights. As in weights. We often see something that's called pitting edema when there's malnutrition and dehydration. And so if you press, you know, either on the foot or on the ankle, so we expect to see a little bit of indentation like that. But when that indentation stays there, that shows that there's not enough fluid and fat mass behind there to recoil back up. Oh my God, he's going out. Identifying malnutrition is important to healthy aging, especially when it comes to certain conditions associated with growing old that might result from poor nutrition. For example, falls, fractures, infections, even minor memory loss can be linked to nutrition-related issues. You can also have other types of malnutrition. For example, you can be deficient in vitamins or minerals and have a micronutrient type of malnutrition. You can have inflammation-related malnutrition. And so there are multiple forms, and they should be treated differently in order to be able to resolve the problem and then promote growth and repair. There is often social isolation that promotes inadequate food intake or less enjoyment for consuming. Hey, sweetie. Hey, Mary, where have you been? I'm 96. Should be 97. Madeline Jeans is proud of her age and that she still lives in her own home eating her own food even if it's not the pleasurable experience it once was. It don't taste as good as it used to. When you get older, everything changes. So you have to accept it. Be happy. Be happy with what you got. Like many older adults, Jeans finds eating more of a chore due to natural changes in her aging body. For example, the sense of taste and smell may weaken. Digestive systems may slow. Chewing and swallowing problems can develop. Mobility can make it hard to shop, cook, and eat. And medications to treat certain conditions can reduce appetite. Despite the challenges, Jeans tries to eat a healthy meal each day. I'm a farm girl. I know what good meals are. <laughs> I feel like it's necessary. My children tell me if I don't eat, I'll be back in the hospital. I think I eat good, but sometimes I think when you get old, it don't do you no good, maybe. Her observation is backed by growing evidence that aging influences how nutrients are absorbed by the body. For example, vitamin D may be low in an older person because aging skin is less able to change sunlight into the vitamin. Same for vitamin B12, which is harder for our bodies to absorb after age 50. While dietary guidelines established by the USDA still apply to older adults, recommended daily caloric intake decreases with age as the metabolism slows down. High fiber, high protein diets become more important, as does calcium. The takeaway here is really that food is medicine and the provision of food should be central to provision of health care. It should be a routine part of health care.
Sarah Downer is with the Harvard Law School Center for Health, Law, and Policy Innovation. She led a study on the impact of medically tailored meals for patients with chronic diseases. And they compared people that were receiving the meals and people who were medically similar had the same medical profile, so they were also very ill, um, that weren't receiving the meals. And what they found was that hospitalizations decreased by half for the population that was receiving the intervention, and that when those patients were hospitalized, the length of the hospitalizations were shorter by about 37 percent. They were more likely than the comparison group to be able to return to their homes rather than go into another acute long-term care facility. And so there were savings on that end as well, and especially if they're challenged by not being able to travel to, where, to the source of healthy food. Never has healthy food been so available, yet so unattainable for many seniors in Tennessee. National reports consistently show this state is among the worst when it comes to percentage of adults age 60 and older who face the threat of hunger, what is known as food insecurity. Food insecurity is not simply hunger. Food insecurity is actually the thoughts and the feelings of not knowing where your next meal is going to come from, not knowing how you're going to get to that next meal, uh, which can be very overwhelming. The nutrition program of the Tennessee Commission on Aging and Disabilities has one main goal, to make sure older residents receive at least one nutritionally balanced hot meal each day for at least five days a week. We wanted to know what the specific barriers were for our older adults in Tennessee. To get that information, the department launched a statewide study on food access among residents age 60 and older with household incomes of $35,000 or less. The findings were stunning even to the researchers. About 30 percent of them are either marginally or very low access to food and so I think we could say that there are there is a considerable vulnerability among this age group. Dr. Ron Aday is a gerontology professor and former director of the Aging Studies Program at Middle Tennessee State University. As we discovered, people have access to food. They may have food in their cabinets, but they, they may not be able to prepare it, you know. Uh, they may have money, but may not be able to, to get to the grocery store or well, walk around the grocery store or get, have transportation. So it's very complicated in terms of kind of narrowing those, those factors down. Some people may have several factors that they're dealing with and others people may have, you know, one or two. The study found that among older Tennesseans who are food insecure, 22 percent didn't eat because they didn't want to eat alone. 47 percent couldn't get food due to health. 39 percent had teeth or mouth problems that made it hard to eat. 63 percent had to choose between medicine or food. 58 percent had to choose between utilities or food. More revealing were the personal interviews conducted confidentially with more than 400 seniors across the state. You see something that looks so good and other people are snatching it up, but it's too expensive, you know? And I can't. And you run out of bread, coffee, to sugar. Everybody, everybody and you just don't have the money to get no. it. Oh, yeah. And I don't want Girl, to for years, I would run out of money and I would have to eat for, say, seven or eight days in a row. For lunch and dinner would be pinto Back beans that I cooked. When my wife passed away, so I, I would go a day without eating. And I had plenty of food in the house. We were kind of surprised, I think, in terms of looking at that, uh, both the psychological issues as well as sometimes the social issues of the lack of desire or motivation, really, to eat healthy food choices. At senior centers like this one in Fayetteville, Tennessee, lunchtime is more than a social outing. It can be key to nutritional health. They're all the same, Mr. Hughes. All the same. Okay. All the same. If this person didn't have this hot meal, they would probably live on snacks. You know, they're not, or, or cereal, or something very, you know, maybe at times healthy, but for the most part not, you know I mean, and how that can help not just their own personal nutrition, but keeping them out of the hospital, keeping them in their homes, and, the, you know, it just goes so much further than the hot meal. This center is funded by the State Nutrition Program as a congregate meal site for seniors. If they're over 60, they show up and can eat for free or offer a donation.
Many seniors face barriers in getting to the meal sites, especially in rural areas like Lincoln County. Miss Harris, I have your lunch. Home delivered meals through this same state funded program is one solution. But participants must meet medical and income criteria, and there is a long waiting list throughout the state. I've already delivered six, so I think I got about eight more. I like to meet the people, be nice to them. I'm the only person they see sometimes. So I just love doing it. It's true that we often think of different types or forms of malnutrition occurring in the oldest old, in people who are in their late 70s, in their 80s, and in their 90s. But what's really interesting in today's hospital patients, we found that 40 to 50 percent of our hospital patients had sarcopenic obesity. Sarcopenia really has two key components. One is the loss of the muscle mass and the other is the loss of the physical strength from having less muscle mass. We are in the middle of an aging boom. Our older adult population is living longer and more and more of them do have overweight and obesity. And so we have a wider prevalence of illness related to malnutrition and injury related to malnutrition. The paradox of obesity and malnutrition in aging has prompted medical experts to revise how obesity is determined. Basically, the most common measurement used is called the body mass index. The body mass index is a formula that takes into account height and weight and gives us a number that can classify us whether we're normal weight, underweight, overweight, obese, etc. It doesn't take into account body composition. So we don't know if that weight is muscle mass or if that weight is fat tissue. And we know that as we age, we have a natural tendency to lose muscle mass and gain fat tissue. We found that it's very important to also determine the location of the fat. And when fat is located in the abdominal cavity, and it's called the visceral adiposity, it tends to be more harmful. So measuring waist circumference, and there are criteria saying, you know, what the waist circumference should be for men and women, that in addition to the BMI, help us determine if somebody's at a healthy weight. I was a really healthy fat person. I was. Other than the falls and injuries I've had, I don't have a whole lot of medical conditions. Liza Gundell could barely walk and was headed for knee replacement surgery at age 53 when she had an aha moment. Maybe changing her diet would improve her joint deterioration and pain. Never did my primary care physician, the orthopedist or the pain management doctor raise the issue of weight in terms of my health. I was surprised. Hi Liza, how are you? Good, how are you? Liza sought help from Dr. Petrakoska and has since lost 54 pounds. So basically, with, with her weight loss, she uh, put herself in a better place for healthier aging. Unless more baby boomers follow Liza's example, the American healthcare system will be unprepared for the consequences of aging, overweight seniors who are also malnourished. It seems that about maybe 20 to 30 years ago, the rates of obesity started increasing. So patients that were young adults at that time now are in that 50, 60 years old range and started gaining weight at that time and now might be overweight or obese. We have an aging population that's not healthy, that's sicker, that cannot take care of itself, with more disability, with problems with cognition. So that will have a huge toll, I think, on, on just the Howard Health System. Mr. Mason? When medical providers pay close attention to the triggers of malnutrition in older patients, it makes a difference, according to Dr. Silver. She's on a mission to develop training and tools to help doctors and nurses intervene earlier and faster. We're working with a group of computer engineering faculty here to develop a mobile phone based software or application that we hope could be implemented in healthcare systems that would help providers 
make diagnosis for malnutrition. Silver hopes that diagnostic tools like the app will lead providers to ask important questions that go beyond the doctor's office visit. They also need to be asking the questions of, are you able to fix your meals at home? Are you able to make it to the grocery store? Do you need some assistance? Because we can't make the assumption that people are just gonna leave the doctor's office and go buy healthy groceries and go home and, and fix their own meals. It's not as simple as that. And 44. That's one reason food is the real attraction at many senior centers. You got it, get your prize. From bingo prizes to take home goodies. I eat here every day. I just love it. The food, bingo. Even for those who have the resources and awareness, eating well and achieving nutritional health while aging is work. I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, monetary, the cost of food continues to go up. Time, we all have good intentions, but can we put it on the table? I'm working at it. It's, it's a work in progress every single day. Do I have it down? No, not necessarily. And I'm not putting myself up as any kind of someone to emulate, but I try. We only live life once. So I want to make sure that as I'm entering, you know, my sixth decade and my seventh decade, that I'm able to do that as healthfully as I possibly can. I want to be able to enjoy retirement when I get there. Uh, you know, who wants to be ill or incapacitated at the time when they're going to be able to do whatever they want? Americans spend a lot of time and money on food and diet in our quest to be healthy. Science is now helping us better understand why and how that changes as we age. It means rethinking the role of food and nutrition in healthcare and what resources and services are most effective in providing good nutrition for healthy aging. To learn more about Aging Matters, visit our website at wnpt.org slash agingmatters. Major funding for NPT Reports, Aging Matters, is provided by the West End Home Foundation, improving the quality of life of seniors through the support of nonprofit organizations in Middle Tennessee, the HCA Foundation on behalf of TriStar Health, the Jeanette Travis Foundation, dedicated to improving the health and well-being of the Middle Tennessee community, and Cigna HealthSpring. Additional support provided by Lyle Parham Wealth Management of UBS Financial Services Incorporated, Jackson National Life Insurance Company, the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, and by members of NPT. Thank you.